Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good afternoon, everyone. It is Tuesday, October the 18th, 2022. It is currently 1.36 p.m. Central Time, and I'm coming to you live from the Theology Central Studios, located right here in Abilene, Texas. Thank you so much for tuning in. I greatly appreciate it. We really do. Always know you can contact me anytime. Newsif at yahoo.com. Newsif at yahoo.com. And obviously this podcast is called the Theology Central Podcast because we try to make theology central. And I am working very, very hard right now. And I have been now for a little while trying to make the theology of law and gospel central to your thinking. I want this to be the central focus as soon as you can make it your central focus. I know some of you, your central focus right now is finish, finishing up your study on the book of Amos for our Bible study exercise series, and I greatly appreciate that. But as soon as you can, make the focus, the proper distinction between law and gospel not only should theology be central to your life, this specific theological issue of law and gospel needs to be center of your life. It needs to be the center of your church. It needs to be the center of your family. I cannot, I cannot even overstate. I can't use enough hyperbole. Like there, like there is no such thing as hyperbole when it comes to trying to tell you how important the distinction is between law and gospel. I can't exaggerate it enough. Because all the exaggeration I could come up with would not even become close to how literally important this is. You need to know law and gospel. And yes, I know I shouldn't do this. I know I shouldn't do this. But I, I, it's hard when you're a podcaster, it's hard not to look at the numbers, right? You look at the numbers. Those numbers tell you a lot. They tell you what people are interested in. They tell you what people are not interested in. They tell you what gets all of the attention, and they tell you what doesn't get any attention. And I can tell you that the series on law and gospel is not a successful series from a human standpoint. People aren't that interested in it. They see law and gospel, whatever, whatever. They may may think that it's not that big a deal. They may even think they understand it. Uh, which is sad. I wish that the Law and Gospel series would be the most successful series I've ever done because I can tell you this, it's the most important. But I, I guess that really, I guess there's a lesson in that. When it comes to theology, when it comes to preaching, when it comes to doctrine, what's most important in many cases will not be the most popular. You can't determine the teaching of doctrine, theology, and preaching based on what's popular. You can't do that. Now, I know that goes against being a podcaster because you, your podcast, you want numbers, right? You need numbers, numbers, numbers. You need clicks. You need subscribers. You need followers. You need people leaving a five-star rating. You need people leaving comments because that's how algorithms pick up your content. That's how people are going to discover you. But when it comes to doctrine and theology as a podcast, you just got to say, I can't worry about the numbers. Can't. I got to do what's important and law and gospel and understanding it. I cannot, again, I cannot overstate it. I can't exaggerate it enough to help you understand it is the most important thing. So again, we're in the month of October. I mentioned this in the last live broadcast. This is a perfect time, the month of October. Reformation, right? The, The Protestant Reformation, Reformation Day. Uh, Everyone else thinks it's, you know, everyone wants to do trunk or treat. We need to be focusing on the Reformation. And what better way to honor the Reformation than understanding properly the distinction between law and gospel, understanding justification correctly, understanding imputed righteousness versus infused righteousness, understanding these very important theological concepts. So this is what we've been doing. We've been doing the series on law and gospel that I've been preaching and teaching uh, from Victory Baptist Church. We've laid out 25 theses on the proper distinction between law and gospel. We we kind of rewrote some of them, making them our own, which I I, I wanted to do it that way, and I wanted everyone involved in that. Uh, again, if you go, uh, if you look at our series, Law and Gospel, you can find it. It's easier to find on the Sermons 2.0 app. Look up Theology Central and look up Series, or just download the Church One app, Church O-N-E, Search for Theology Central, make us the chosen broadcaster. That turns the Church One app into the Theology Central app. 
Look for the series on law and gospel and find the episode that says law and gospel PDF. You'll see attached to that episode is a PDF file, which which gives our 25 theses. We are very grateful for the listener who put that together for us. That's so awesome. So I've been doing the teaching, but I, you know, if you listen to me, almost any series we do, you know that this is going to happen at some part in the series. I'm going to be doing my teaching. You know, typically I'm going to give you homework and assignments. And then you know I'm going to find additional teaching on the subject that we will review, that we will critique, that we will analyze. So in order to give a different voice, a different perspective, or maybe the same perspective, but a different voice to the subject we're looking at, just to, I want to add as much content as I can. I don't want you to ever walk away from this podcast going, man, I think I'm still spiritually hungry. Now, I want you, by the time you're done with my podcast, I want you to go, I can't eat another bite. I I, I can't, I, I, oh, I, I'm i stuffed. I can't, I, that's what I try to do. I try to do that. I try. Now, some people make fun of how many episodes we do in a year. I know, somewhere close to a thousand episodes a year. I know that, but I would rather do too many than not enough, all right? So, but w- typically what I do is throw in the additional teaching, and that's what I started this morning. We're doing some additional teaching on the subject of law and gospel, uh, that was preached at a conference. We're looking at the first message preached at this conference. And um, it's been very interesting so far, all right? They definitely define law and gospel. Law is defined as, well, commands, right? Demands uh, uh, and condemnation, right? The law, if you want to understand the law, the law commands, the law demands, and the law condemns. That's what the the law says. Do this and you shall be saved. Do this and you will live. Do this in order to prove you're saved, right? That's still law. Like, do this to prove you're saved. That's still you're looking to the law to prove your salvation, which you should immediately realize theologically, wait a minute, that doesn't work. Law is never there to give assurance. Law is not there to prove my salvation. Law is there to show me my sin and condemn me. Because the demands of the law, if you're looking to them to prove your salvation, you're in trouble because the law demands perfect obedience internally and externally. The law demands perfect obedience internally and externally. Think of it this way, and and, and the uh, teaching that we are have been reviewing, think of it this way. I, I wrote this down in my notes. The law demands perfect obedience entire, exact, and perpetual obedience. So when it says, well, how do I know I'm saved? Well, do you do this? Do you do this? Do you do this? Do you do this? They're giving you law, right? They're telling you, you have to do this. You have to do this. You have to do this. Well, then guess what? Here's what should come along with the test. Not only do you have to do these things to prove that you're saved, what you do has to be perfect, has to be entire, has to be exact, has to be perpetual, because that's what the law demands. But we we somehow go, no, 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 no. You're not going to do it perfectly, but you have to be doing it. There has to be some of it there. So you're telling me my disobedience to the law can prove that I'm saved? No, that that may no 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 my partial obedience to the law proves that I'm saved. No partial the law doesn't accept partial obedience. The d- law demands perfect, exact, entire, and perpetual obedience. And a very important scripture that we looked at is Galatians chapter three, verse ten. Galatians chapter three, verse ten. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written. Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. The law says, do this, do this, do that. The gospel says Christ has done it. Christ completed it. Christ finished it. Think of it. What the law demands, Christ did. The law demands perfect obedience. Christ gave perfect obedience. Exact obedience, Christ gave exact obedience. Entire obedience and perpetual obedience. Christ did it all for you. And in Christ, his obedience is imputed to you. So what do I look for salvation? Yeah, you want to say, well, if, if you're truly saved, then you're gonna, then there's going to be something to show for it. There's going to be some proof. And I will say, absolutely, if I'm truly saved, there's going to be proof. 
It's going to be perfect obedience, entire obedience, exact obedience, and perpetual obedience. And it's not going to be for me. It's from Christ. You look to Christ for your assurance, not to yourself. So that's what we kind of looked at and we listened to this morning. Now we're going to continue our review of this teaching on law and gospel, this additional teaching on law and gospel to go along with our series. And the, the speaker has now made it to the point where he's kind of defined the law, what the law demands. Now he wants to have us look at the proper uses of the law. What are the proper uses of the law? That's where he is. And that's what we're going to try to do. We're going to try to finish this review um, to this message. And then maybe we'll review some more additional messages tomorrow, tomorrow night at Victory Baptist Church. If everything works right, I'll be behind the pulpit. And guess what? We'll continue our teaching on law and gospel, doing a little bit of history, looking at the London Baptist Confession of Faith. And then we'll start working through our 25 theses and starting with the first one. So we've got a lot to do in this series. Please follow it, listen to all of it, share it with as many people as possible, because I truly believe that this is a, a absolutely essential theological issue that every Christian needs to be confronted with and every Christian needs to understand properly. And that's not hyperbole. That's not an exaggeration, because even if it was hyperbole and exaggeration, that still wouldn't be enough hyperbole and enough exaggeration to really try to demonstrate to you how important this is. So are you ready? Let's go back to this conference. Long Gospel Part 1. Now, now going to talk about the proper uses of the law. I see people improperly use the law in churches all across the United States of America and in individual Christians' lives, just like I've improperly used the law in my life and in my preaching way too many times. Moral, civil, and ceremonial. That's kinds. I won't be able to be talking about kinds tonight or tomorrow. I'm going to talk about uses. How is the law used? But law at its deepest level is to do. Do this and live. Kinds of law we could discuss, but I'm going to talk about uses of law. How many uses of God's law are there? God has imperatives. He's the king. He's the creator. He tells us what to do. What are the uses of the law? How many? First, second, and third. Three different kinds of uses. Let's talk about that a little bit, especially in this introductory one, so when I say this tomorrow, you'll know what they are. So the first use of the law is for unbelievers. Now, there's some difference on how we number these, but we'll just go with mine because I have the microphone. Um, think of a mirror and this is for unbelievers so the unbelievers look at the law and they see who they really are because compared to everybody else they're probably pretty good but the unbeliever looks at the law of God the perfect law of God we'll talk about the holy law of God representing his nature and his character and they look at the law of God and it's to show them who they are uh, I like it when I kind of go to my daughter's room when she lived at home, and she had this mirror about this big, and it had a 10X on the bottom. I don't know what that means, but a 10X at the bottom. And then it had a round thing that was illumined. And you turn that thing on. I mean, I, I, I just look at the mirror regularly, and I think it's pretty good. But now my eyes are so bad, I shave, and then I have to turn that 10X mirror on because I've got spots and crevices and cracks and creases and pores and s'mores and everything else. I'm like, look at me. I see the real me. And I think lots of things, including praise God from whom all blessings flow. I married a woman who kept her word 25 years ago, and I still have a wife. So who'd want to live with this person? So the first use of the law, when you hear use, the first use is for unbelievers and it's a I want us to stop right here. I know he's saying it's for unbelievers, but I would I got to drive this point home. People who kind of live in a law-based Christianity, a law-focused theology, right? Even though they would say they're gospel-based, they're law-based because they're constantly saying, well, if you're truly saved, you'll do this, 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 this. They're constantly pointing to the law. How do you know you're saved? You do this. Well, you want assurance? Look to this. It's it's law-based. You need to do this. You need to do this. Imperative, 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 imperative. Demands, commands, and condemning. That's that's kind of their Christianity. Even though they will say, no, I'm, you believe, I believe you're saved by grace alone through faith alone, they undermine it because they constantly turn to the law. Let me make it very 
clear. The law, you cannot look to the law for assurance of salvation, and here's why. The law simply magnifies and reveals what you really are. It's a sinner. A gospel-based mindset is one where you don't have to pretend. You don't cover it up. You can just acknowledge, I'm a sinner and I fall short. A law-based system almost immediately creates a behavioral modification where you clean up the outside of the cup and you convince yourself that you're meeting all of these supposed tests that prove you're safe. Oh, I truly love God. I love my neighbor as myself. I'm pure. I'm You, you spend your life compl- con- convincing yourself you are what you are not. Gospel base is you spend your life acknowledging what you are not, what you are not, and trusting and who Christ is and what he has done. Law-based creates a pharisaical, a Sadducee mindset where you wrap yourself in robes of self-righteousness. You cover yourself in fig leaves, convincing yourself that you're doing all these wonderful things. But if you truly looked at the law that you think proves you're saved, if you truly would see the law for what it is, you would be like, oh my goodness, what is wrong with me? Because you, you, your, your obedience is not perfect. It's not exact. It's not entire. It's not perpetual. You are condemned. And you need to be gospel-based. That destroys self-righteousness because it means you can only trust in the imputed righteousness and you can be much more honest with your struggles and your failures. And not everyone has to act like they're so wonderful and godly only to sooner or later it's exposed that you're not. The mirror. Think mirror. Maybe I have a quote here that I can talk about. Luther, the theological or spiritual use which serves to increase transgression. This is the primary purpose of the law of Moses, that through it sin might grow and be multiplied, especially in the conscience. I'm a sinner. It's it's trying to push me even farther so that I might say, oh, I need a savior. We'll talk about the rich young ruler soon enough. And I think that's interesting. The law really increases transgression. It, it, push, it promotes transgression. If you're in a law-based Christianity that says, do this, 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 stop this, stop this, do this, all the do's and the don'ts and the commands, you think that it will help you spiritually, but it really, it, it doesn't. It, it only increases transgression. Oh, it may move the transgression from the external to the internal, but I'm telling you, law does not kill sin. It does not destroy. It does not mortify sin. It increases. It, it promotes it. You say, no, it, no, it does. You need gospel. You need grace. The law is just to reveal it to you. That's, that's his primary function. But the rich young ruler, he comes to Jesus, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus shows him what? Law or gospel? Keep these laws. And this young man should have said, I don't keep them at all, but I've heard that you're a merciful God. And I've heard you often give mercy to people. Would you be merciful to me? The first use condemns, accuses. Maybe you can think about your own life. Remember before you got saved, you're reading the Bible and all of a sudden you're thinking, that's me. I'm dead in trespasses and sins. I'm an enemy of God. I have no righteousness. Even my best righteousness would be like filthy rags. I often- and I'm just going to step in here. I think that same use, that, that use is for believers as well. See, sometimes we're like, that's for the unbeliever. No, it's for me as well. I constantly need to be reminded of how far short I fall to God's standards. That Look, the more you, the law is used, it is used that way for the unbeliever, but it's got to be used this way for the believer as well. I don't like that this one is for the unbeliever. It's for the believer too. The more the law reveals to you your sin, it destroys self-righteousness. It destroys reliance on the flesh, and it it, dis- and it uh, so it destroys self righteousness. It destroys reliance on the on the flesh, and it destroy it destroys that desire to cover up. It destroys that desire to pretend, because you know you can't pretend. So I, this this use of the law has to be for believers as well. I know they're they're going. I, We'll see what he does when he gets to believers. But I'm telling you, that is just as much needed in the life of the believer as it is in the unbeliever.
for nothing to God. How many times do you have to spit in the king's face before he condemns you? This is me. I see the mirror of the word of God. I'm not just sinning against a powerful God who creates, although that's true. I'm sinning against a powerful God who creates and who stains, sustains and preserves. And I have his law. I see my sins for what they are and who they're against. Melanchthon, who followed Luther or was with Luther, said the law shows the disease. The second use is a curb. Think of a curb that's something that restrains. So the mirror for the unbeliever, it shows them their sin. The second use is for believers and unbelievers, and it restrains sin. It's why we have laws in America. It's why we have... I don't... I, I, I have a little bit of problem with this one, right? I understand what, what it's being said here, right? It, it's supposed to, when I say a curb, I, I see a curb as a check, right? Like you're driving along, boom, I hit the curb. I hit the curb, right? I hit the curb. It tells me to get, it gives me, it gives me the, it gives me a marker of like, no, that's out of bounds. That's the curb. The law gives me a curb. I don't think it actually restrains sin. I think it reveals it. It condemns it. It tells you what is wrong. I don't know if law curbs it because the law can't curb. Okay. Sin originates from a sinful nature. The law is external, external. It reveals that nature. It doesn't curb the nature. So I, I, so I, if, if I, I see the curb more as a marker, right? It lets us know that's wrong. But it's like uh, I, I use, I've used this illustration in my sermons here. I, I, I don't know about in your state, but in West Texas, you get on the highway, all right? You're driving along, okay? Driving, driving, driving. You either start looking at your phone, you're looking out the window, you're just in la la land, you're whatever, and all of a sudden you start drifting to the right, right? Okay, if you drift to the left, you're in someone else's lane, but drift to the right, and all of a sudden, you hear this. It's a rumble strip, and that rumble strip's like, hey, 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 get back on the get back on the road. The law to me is like a rumble strip saying, hey, 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 you're going the wrong way. You're going the wrong way. It lets me know. I don't think it actually, the rumble, the, 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 it doesn't curb my sin. That rumble strip is out, it's external to me, right? I can ignore the rumble strip and go right off the road. It's my nature. It, it can't curb my sin nature. It can, it can tell me that I'm wrong and I can try to do some behavioral modification, but if the law could just fix, think of it this way. If the law could just curb sin or somehow stop sin, lessen sin, then I, I think that the, all a Christian we need to do is just read the law and we would start sinning less and less and less and less and less. I, 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 think, I think the law simply lets me know. You, you may think that the law has a, a greater influence, but I think, I think the law just makes me, be, I may modify my behavior. Uh, it, it's kind of like the, uh, it was an illustration. I don't remember all the details of the illustration, but it's some child keeps standing up and the parents like, I'm telling you, sit down. And the, the child keeps standing, I, sit down. The child stands back up. I'm telling you, sit down or you're going to get punished. And the child finally sits down, huh, crosses her arms. I'm sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. Well, I think that that's what law, law will get you to sit, will get you to sit down on the outside, but it doesn't change you uh, to standing up on the inside. You may be sitting down on the outside, but you're standing up on the inside. If I mess that up, the kid, if I, if I said that incorrectly, the kid sat down and said, I may be sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. That's exactly, I think law gets you to sit down externally, but it doesn't get you to sit down internally. So I... It may keep us in check a little bit, but it doesn't, it gets us in check externally. It doesn't get us in check internally. That's what I'm trying to say. We have laws in our town. It restrains men and women from sin. And that's not really debated. But the third use of the law is what I want to talk about a little bit more tonight. It's a guide. So for the unbeliever, first use mirror, believer and unbeliever, they realize if I do things that are wrong, the punishment from the government will come. And now this last law is 
for Christians, and it's called a guide. I say, I think the law for the Christian has all three purposes. I say, I don't, I don't like this distinction. I'm not a fan of this distinction. I know it's classical uh, theology to give this distinction. I just think it's, I think it's unfortunate because I need the, the first use of the law in my life all the time. I need to see my sin continually as a believer. Every single day, I need to see my sin, see my sin, understand my sin. And every time I read the Bible, I'm confronted with law. And I'm like, man, man, I fall short. I fall short. I said to try to convince myself, well, well, no, I, I, I do. I, I'm doing pretty good there. No, fill the full bitterness of the law. Every time you read the law in the Bible, you need to drink in that bitterness and you need to taste it because that drives you to the sweetness of the gospel, all right? So I need that continually. The curb, we all need to know where the road, you know, hey, yo, I'm going off the road. We need that. Now, a guide to the believer, let's see how, he, how he's going to describe that. And it's so important for you. I'm not going to, I exaggerate often, but I'm not going to exaggerate now. You need to figure out the difference between the first use of the law and the third use of the law if you like assurance. You say, what do we mean by that? Well, we'll fill that in as we go. This is important. It's a guide. Look at the same page. If you want assurance, don't look to the law. There, there, there you go. He says we have to know the distinction. I'm, I'm just going to tell you. Here's what. Do not look to the law for assurance. Now, if you look to the law, that's going to condemn you. Your assurance has to be in Christ. You look to the gospel for assurance. That's the problem. We keep trying to give people assurance by pointing them to the law, which is contradictory. As you just were looking at in your Trinity hymnal, for London Baptist Confession, number six, law of God, section 19, number six. How do we live a Christian life? Are we antinomian? Do we just lay back and let God? What do we do? Number six, law of God, chapter 19, section six. Although true believers be not under the law as a covenant of works, that is, you, you actually obey to get into heaven, to be thereby justified or condemned, yet it is of great use to them as well as to others. That is, as a rule or a guide or someone that directs or norms of life, informing them of the will of God and their duty. It directs and binds them to walk accordingly. So let's use this as an illustration. I say to an unbeliever, if you look at a woman with lust you stand condemned of adultery. Yes? First use. But God's law doesn't change when I become a Christian. Should Christians be morally pure, sexually pure, be only uh, engaged in sexual activity in marriage? The answer is yes, yes, and yes. The law is still the same for the Christian. Don't look at a woman with lust. But my relationship to the lawgiver is different. Because the relationship that the unbeliever has with the lawgiver is judge. Do this or else. Now because of the work of the Lord Jesus, the one who perfectly, entirely, exactly, and perpetually obeyed and died for my sins and yours when we didn't do that, he now hands us the law. We have a, a mediator. What's the difference between a mediator and an advocate? My friend tells me that the mediator stands between the Father and us, and the advocate stands with us before the Father. And you have both a mediator and an advocate. Isn't that good? You have an advocate before the Father. So we're no longer having to obey God in order to be saved, but his laws aren't different because it's a moral law of God. It reflects his nature. His nature doesn't change. Don't commit adultery. Now, for the Christian, we don't want to commit adultery, but it's a guide for us. Do Christians sin? Yes, but we have a relationship that's different. So when I talk about kinds of law, that's moral, civil, ceremonial. But in this discussion tonight, it's uses of the law. To the unbeliever, the law of God, should you preach the law of God to unbelievers? Yes. Uh, you may not like everything about the way of the master in their evangelism. The positive side is they preach the law, trying to show them that they're sinful, not ill, uh, not 
uh, having a disease or a syndrome. I've sinned against God. How many sins against God does it take before he damns people? James chapter 2. One. You've sinned against God. You need relief. You need help. You need the Savior. What does Romans chapter 3 verse 19 say? Matter of fact, we should just look it up. Romans 3 19. When it comes to the law of God, what are we trying to do when we're talking to the unbeliever? Romans 3. And let's just take that to its logical conclusion. If it only takes one sin to condemn you, well, then why would you look to the law for assurance? And anyway, why would you look to the law to prove your salvation? Because all I'd have to do is show you that you have, you still violate one law. You're condemned. So you're like, well, love God. Okay, well, I don't love him perfectly, but I love him some. Well, that that can't be assurance because God demands not a perfect love. So an incomplete obedience. And even if you say you love God, I can find some other scripture that you violate. And as long as you violate one scripture, you're guilty of them all. You're still condemned. So why do we give people law for assurance? And the law needs to be preached to us as well to constantly show us our sins. To constantly show us our sins. So uh, let me let me work this illustration he's using. If you look at a woman with lust, you've committed adultery in your heart. Guess what? Unbelievers are guilty of that. Believers are guilty of that. We are both guilty of it. The, what the unbeliever doesn't need to stop doing that, what they need to do first of all is come to Christ and be saved. Now that we are saved, we understand that God calls us to moral purity. Yes, he calls us not to look at a woman with lust. We're still going to fall short. And if you think that we're not, you're, fo- you're fooling yourself. Uh, I, I can't speak for women, but I can speak for men. Th- th- this is a major issue and men know that, right? We're still going to fall short. So, do I, if I fall short, does that prove that I'm not saved? No, what, what it demonstrates is I still need that imputed righteousness. So what should motivate me to try to follow this? It should be because of the graciousness of God and because of the, the gospel promises and what the gospel has done. Now, law shows me what I should seek to do, but the law can't, the law's not, can't be the motivator. The law can't be the motivator because the law simply condemns me. You say, well, the law is the guide. The the law shows me, but it's going to condemn. The motivator has to be the gospel. And I think that's what we have to try to change our way of thinking about. In that great section there, not really quoting Moses in verses 10 and following, but rather the Psalms. And what does he say? In verse 19 of Romans 3, now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, that is unbelievers, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may be accountable to God because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. You know what Paul's trying to say there? When you talk to people and unbelievers about the law, And they're like, yeah, but you don't understand. Or I have an exception. Or I'm not as bad as somebody else. That's not when you talk about the Lord Jesus. You keep giving them more law and more law until they finally, hopefully say, by the Spirit's power and the Father's drawing hand, do you know what? If what you say is true, I stand condemned. I'm going to go to hell when I die. What you said is true. It is true in my life. Guilty is charged. By the way, if you ever get pulled over by the police, is anybody here a police officer? Highway patrol? Sheriff, yes. If you pulled me over and said, sir, do you know that you're speeding, you're going 85? I would look at you, hands 10 and 2, and I said, yes, officer, I did know that. I want to give you an excuse, but I am guilty. Because that's the word nobody ever uses with police officers. They all give them excuses. Nine times out of 10, they don't write me a ticket because I said that one word, guilt. I'm guilty. Would you give me a ticket? See? This community policing. What are we doing? Just kidding. I stand guilty before the law because the, it's a mirror to my soul. You probably know what it's like when you heard your friend preach to you or maybe your mom or your dad or you're listening to a sermon and you're thinking, there's not anybody else in this room. It's like me and God. He knows my soul. And I stand condemned. And all those things that I used to think were fun and everything else, I, I, I'm going to go to hell. I, I stand condemned before God. That's what we want the law to do as a mirror is to shut their people's mouths. So then we can say something about the good news. Second use, 
Society knows, don't commit adultery, there's going to be consequences. But the third use is, it's from the hand of the Son to guide us. Uh, Let's use an interesting illustration, not in my notes. Turn to Proverbs 5, please. I could pick Proverbs 2, Proverbs 3, Proverbs 4, 5, 6, 7. But let's just pick 5. Proverbs chapter 5. How do we relate to God with the third use of the law? By the way, there's all kinds of law in the New Testament that's third use. Use your spiritual gifts. Don't complain. Serve one another. Encourage one another. I mean, there's law after law after law. Here, that law after law after law, you've got to make sure you understand this. It still condemns you. It still tells you you are a sinner and that you still need to look to Christ. I don't know if you can just say, well, that law, that that law condemns, this this law is a guide. All law condemns. So first and foremost, it it reveals, it condemns, right? It reveals and it condemns. And then, well, ultimately, I think it points to Christ, so I, I, to me, the law reveals sin, it condemns sin, and then it points you to Christ. Now, if you want to talk about a curb and a guide, okay, it's maybe a curb, but it's there to do what? Hey, get back on the road. Hey, you're wrong. Hey, this is wrong. Hey, this is wrong. If it guides, yes, it may say, this is what God, this is what God's standard. This is what God wants. But uh, let me make it clear again. You're still of a sinful nature. So all of those, do this, don't do this, that's still law. And it's, you're going to say, well, no, 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 that's, that's, that's the third use. It's, it's a guide. Okay, it may be guiding me, but it, it's still going to condemn me. Because I'm, I'm telling you, you can look at all the guiding, supposedly, law in the New Testament. And you're still going to find yourself falling short of it over and over and over again. And why do you keep falling short? Because the sinful nature doesn't go away. It's a good illustration, I think, of... What I'm trying to say, Proverbs 5, well, matter of fact, go to chapter 2. First two words of chapter 2, my son. Chapter 3, my son. Chapter 4, hear, O sons. Chapter 5, my son. Chapter 6, my son. Chapter 7, my son. What if the son does do what the father has commanded him not to do? Will he get kicked out of the family? Think about it. Is there anything that your child could do for you to say you're no longer an Abendroth? It's unconditional love, right? So the love of God is unconditional. And you think of Genesis chapter 15 and, and Abraham or Abram at the time and, and cutting that covenant. God alone cuts a covenant with himself. Abraham's job was just to, to sleep. There's nothing my children could ever do for me to say you're no longer my son. But we have a relationship, too, when it comes to driving dad's car. And you can drive dad's car if you're not drinking, if you get home on time, if you don't hit things and run. If you get in an accident, that's fine. By the way, I was, I was devastated when my kids said, um, uh, when they're like, if we ever get in an accident, who do you hope answers the phone, dad or mom? And all the kids are like, mom, we hope mom answers the phone. That's because I'm such an ogre idiot. Instead of saying, are you girls Okay. Yeah, Dad, we're okay. Okay, that's all right. I love you, Dad. I'll be right there. Versus $1,000 deductible. What were you doing? I told you to look both ways. Law. They should look at me and say, Dad, you just told us law when it comes to driving. So I have rules. I have discipline if they disobey. Will God discipline you as a Christian if you disobey his law? He's guiding you. He's telling you what the right thing to do is. It's like the father saying to the son, Son, this is the, the way that you glorify me, and it's good for you. And if you break it, there's just. And I completely agree that as a Christian, the law is there. If you want to say in a guide to to tell me what he wants me to do and to expect me to do it. But the motivating, the motivating factor to do it is should be the gospel promises, the comfort, the grace, the mercy of the gospel. Not if I don't do this, I got to do this to prove that I'm saved. And if I don't do this, I'm saved. And I didn't prove that I, I didn't change enough. And and I can, because there's going to be a change that becomes law, 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 law. And it will not motivate. It will 
not change. It will only create self-righteousness. It will only create hypocrisy. It will only create Pharisees. It's all it will create. We have to be gospel-based. So the law is there to reveal, to condemn. It is there to demand. That's what it's there for. All right. That's the use. And that use is for Christian and non-Christian alike. It's for both. The, now for the non-Christian is to condemn, to point to Christ. And I, I think even for the Christian, every time we read the law, every time we hear the law, it should make us run to what well, we, this is what we have a tendency to do. When Christians hear the law, when Christians hear the law in a sermon, they get, this is how it almost always works, especially in churches with altar calls. The, usually the sermon is law, law, law. You should be doing this. You should be doing this. And you don't read your Bible enough. And you don't do this. And you don't do this. And how come you don't do this? And you claim to be a Christian. You don't do this. And you claim to be a Christian. I don't even know if you should call yourself a Christian. Law, 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 law. And then what do you need to do? Oh, I'm going to try harder. I'm going to pray more. I'm going to go to the altar and tell I'm sorry. And I'm going to cry and I'm going to work harder. And you, and you make all these, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. Law based sermons create a situation where the people are going to try harder. No, what it should do is make you run to Christ. It should make you fall on your face and say, thank you for imputed righteousness. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you, thank you, thank you, because I don't love the way I'm supposed to. I don't forgive the way I'm supposed to. But we almost like, okay, this week I'm really gonna, you hear people after a sermon like this, I'm, I was so convicted by that. Thank you, pastor. Wow, I really needed to hear that. And 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 on some ways, as a preacher, you're like, oh, wow, they, it but you know, if you're not careful, they're going to walk out, walk out. I'm going to try harder. I'm going to try harder. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Six, three months later, they're saying the same thing. Oh, I really needed to hear that. I'm so convicted. I'm gonna, and they try and try and try. And some people reach the point of total, just devastated. They give up. They're demoralized. And they're like, what's the point? This Christian stuff doesn't work. Law for the Christian and for the unchristian, for, for the Christian and for the non-Christian, for, for those saved and those unsaved. The law should reveal, it should condemn, but it should drive us to the gospel. It drives the unbeliever to the gospel for salvation. It drives us to Christ for comfort, for motivation, for, for that, that we, Everything must be based from a gospel-based perspective, but we typically focus it on a law-based perspective, which means we get the entire Christian life wrong. Discipline, there's chastisement, but the relationship to the lawgiver is key. So when you read passages in the scripture about being judged for every word that's ever, that you've ever said, I want you to think through this a little bit. If you're judged for every word you've said, you're in big trouble. But if Jesus has been judged for every word you've ever said, I think you're going to be fine. So when it comes to the law, law is... Okay, stop right there. This is perfect. You're going to be judged for every word that comes out of your mouth. You are going to be judged for that. Woe is me. I am condemned. Now, what some people, when they hear that sermon, okay, I'm going to try harder. I'm not going to say this word. I'm going to try harder. I'm going to try harder. No, what, what, what you should do is run to Christ and go, Christ, you, you pray, God, Christ, Jesus, you know, you know my mouth, you know my words, you know the things that I say that are, you know the corrupt communication that proceeded out of my mouth, you know the bitterness, the hatred, the sarcasm, the whatever that it is that hurts people, that tears people down, I don't build people up with my mouth, you know how far I fall short. And it shouldn't be, I will try harder. It should be, Lord, forgive me. Give me your mercy and grace. I trust in your imputed righteousness. And then hopefully, because of God's mercy and grace, that should be the motivating factor for you to hopefully begin to develop a more Christ-like tone in your, or a more Christ-like character in your speech. It should be the gospel that motivates you. Do, obey, keep, because the law condemns, it demands, and it's inflexible. There are kinds of law, like civil and ceremonial, but what I'm trying to stress tonight is the uses of God's law. 
Use one is, it's a mirror for the unbeliever and we preach the law to them so they see their need of a Savior. Use two, it's used in society just to restrain sin. I'm not talking about that much tonight, about that. And the third use of the law is, I love you. This is for my glory and this is for your own good. Therefore, God says to us, obey the law. Those are called uses of the law. The first one is for unbelievers. The second is for both. The third. Again, the first use is for everyone. Everyone. Everyone, whenever we hear the law, we need to see ourselves and feel the condemnation so that we run to Christ and his crucifixion and his death and his burial. One guide is for Christians only. Question two, what is the gospel? And when I talk to pastors, I always say, well, make sure when you talk about the gospel, you smile because it's good news. I have good news for you. By the way, how many people here think it's a good idea to live the gospel? I hear about it all the time. Live the gospel. Go live the gospel. How's it working out for you? Spouses, how many, how many spouses here think their spouse that they're married to lives the gospel? I mean, you can't live the gospel because the gospel's news, we proclaim it. Only way I could think about the gospel to be lived is maybe I could mime or something. I like mime that I'm up on the cross, mime that I'm like in the tomb. But that would just be dumb. You, you can't live the gospel because the good news is proclaimed. Uh, could you give birth to the gospel, ladies? That's a weird question. I heard somebody preach this week. I've never heard it in my life. They said, Mary gave birth to the gospel. But if you hear the word gospel, every time you do, you think the gospel is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is good news incarnate. I think that'll rescue some of those weird looks that you just gave me. (laughs) Jesus, when we talk about it's gospel-centered, good news, we're talking about a person. And I know what you're thinking, maybe, because you have a pastor, a pastoral team, that they're very well articulated when it comes to the Trinity. Do you get that? Do you get that from your pastors? Our pastors understand not everything about the Trinity, but what is revealed, they've got a good grasp on it, right? So what if I'm always talking about Jesus, the gospel incarnate? Does that mean I'm not Trinitarian? When I talk about the gospel, I'm going to talk mostly about the Lord Jesus here, but when I say Jesus, here's what I want you to think about. The Father sent the Son, and the Father and the Son sent the Spirit. And every time I say the word Holy Spirit, I want you to think he was sent by both the Father and the Son. And every time I would say God the Father, he's ascending God, he's unbegotten, and he sends the begotten Son, not made, and then he sends the Spirit with the Son. Every time I say Father, I want you to think of Son, and every time I say Son, I want you to think Father and Spirit. And every time you say that, then I want you to take a deep breath and go, okay, I get what you're saying. We have one God, and so is it fine that we talk about the the Lord Jesus? Yes, because the Father was pleased to send him. And the Spirit's pleased to point to him to say, worship him and believe in him. So when I'm talking about gospel, I'm mainly talking about good news to be proclaimed. It is good news. Lots of times I go to church services and I walk out so discouraged because all I've gotten is law, 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 law. Is there anything wrong with law? No, but there's everything wrong with its only law. I'd like some good news. We're going to talk about why Christians need good news, too. When I was in the Czech Republic once, I was trying to keep people awake like you all and just help and assist in in teaching. And so I went like this, and I stood up on the front with my shoes on. And I learned later that one of the pet peeves in their culture was never to stand on a chair with your shoes. I learned that later. It's probably true here uh, as well. But a person who has good news would stand on a chair with shoes, probably with sandals, and say, I have good news for you. Ronald Reagan won in a landslide. Okay, if you didn't like that. um, It's a girl. I have four children, not a grandpa yet. I thought I was going to die in that hospital last year. Grandpa-less. And my daughter's pregnant. She's due in October. And by the way, I have some good news for you. It's a boy. (laughs) It's an announcement. It's a proclamation. It's good news. That's what Johnson used to say. Good news is something you're supposed to say on tiptoes. 
And that's what a good news is. There's a Savior born, Christ Jesus the Lord. The, 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 the Pharisees, they didn't like that news, but it was good news. The shepherds, they knew the news. The gospel is good news, and it's focused around the person and work of the Lord Jesus. And while the law condemns and accuses and demands and guides and is a mirror, the gospel is a lot different. I better stand down before I fall over. We have to have a healing service. <laughs> now, strictly speaking, the law is only, excuse me, the gospel is only about Jesus. There's some general talk about the gospel. If I say Mark 1 1, the gospel of Jesus Christ, there's some laws in the gospel of Mark, true? So generally speaking, gospel could be like the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Sometimes Calvin called the New Testament the gospel and the Old Testament the law. So there's general terminology. But specifically or strictly, I'm talking today about the the gospel as the proclamation of the risen Savior. For the distinction, think of the gospel as the good news of what Christ has done, completed, satisfied for you, all right? There are the general uses, but it's, a, it's the good news of what Christ has done, what's completed for you. That's why in the gospel, if you're gospel-minded, you can't point to people like, well, if you're truly saved, you'll do this, 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 this. That, that's, you're pointing people away from the gospel. You're pointing them to what they are supposed to do. The gospel doesn't make you look to yourself. It points you, it will, it's, it's all, it's just proclaims Christ, what Christ has done for you. John Brown of Haddington was asked, what is the gospel, how is the gospel usually distinguished? And he said, into the gospel largely taken and the gospel strictly taken. How is the gospel strictly taking? Taken. It is the glad tidings of salvation to lost sinners through Jesus Christ. Turn to your London Baptist Confession, please, in front of you. It's funny how the chapter after the law is the what? The gospel. Of the gospel. Is this good news or not? That's what the word gospel means, good news. You think of 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 5, 3 to 5. The covenant of works, number one, being broken by sin. Who broke, who, who broke God's law initially? Adam. How many people here know the New England primer? You have to get on there, especially if you're teaching your children or grandchildren about the Bible and God. It's called the New England primer. It's where we would get things... Like this, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to take. It teaches children with letters good Reformed theology. What's A? In Adam's fall, we sinned all. It's got good ones too for kids to think about. X, what would you say for X if you had to do all the alphabet? X, Xerxes must die and so must you and I. Oh, nice. Children. Oh, and why is even worse? Worse. While youth may be near, while youth may be dear, death may be near. <laughs> Welcome to New England. We stab you in the front, not in the back. So Adam sins. What's the, what's the confession say? God was pleased. So far, so good to give forth the promise of Christ, the seed of the woman. This is all Genesis 3 as the means of calling of the elect and begetting in them faith and repentance in this promise of the gospel as to the substance of it was revealed and is therein effectual for the conversion of salvation and salvation of sinners. And you think it's kind of archaic, kind of 1689. Let me translate it for you. It's good news for sinners. Sinners have a way to be reconciled before God that you could stand before God on your deathbed. I'm, I'm laying there 10 months ago and I think, I'm going to die. Passwords to my wife, um, life insurance to my wife. I thought, well, the only upside to me dying now is my million dollar life insurance policy is only good till I'm 64. I'm 62 now, so at least she'll be a millionaire. I guess it's okay. 64, she gets nothing. I'm like, okay. Eternity's really long. I stand before God and then what? Baptism, will that work? I've been baptized as an infant in the Lutheran church. I've been fully immersed. 
in the Jordan River. (laughs) I know I've sinned. No judge would think, you know what? You've done some bad things, but you did enough good things to make up for them. No, no, I'd be judged for the bad things I did. Eternity's a long time and is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. And this is exactly what Christians do when it comes to assurance. They'll say, well, I know that I'm saved because of the good that I've done, but you would be condemned because of the bad that you continue to do. So how much, like, uh, well, there's a little bit of good that proves I'm saved. No, there's enough bad that would prove that you're not saved. So why do you look at the little good to think, convince yourself that that proves you're saved? And not the bad, which should prove that you're not saved. As long as there's a little bit of good, then I know that I'm saved. I've just got to see a little bit of change. Well, but the lack of change would condemn you. If if the little bit of change supposedly gives you assurance that you're saved, the lots of not change should prove that you were never saved. So why is it? It's just so bizarre how people get caught up into like, no, you, there's got to be change. That's it's, There's got to be something that will prove that you're saved. Well, wait a minute. Whatever you point to me to prove that you're saved, I can point to all the things that would prove that you're not saved because the law demands perfect obedience internally and externally. It has to be perfect. It has to be exact. It has to be uh uh, perpetual. Let's see, I, I got them written down here. I, I should know them now by by heart. Uh, they uh, have to be perfect, entire, exact, and perpetual. That's what has to be. Well, it's not. So whatever you're saying, this proves you're saved. I would argue no, because I'm going to look at all the other things and say that's not enough good to prove you're saved because you've got more bad than you have good. So why why does it that the way it works when people go that direction? Now, the law is not what you look to prove you're saved. The law is what's going to show that you are condemned. What you look is for what Christ did. And everything you say, you've got, look, uh, okay, so if you take, say, the MacArthur test or the Jonathan Edwards test to prove that you're saved, I'm like, give me that test. I do all of those things. Oh, you do? Yeah, so you're saved. Okay, yeah, all right, go, thank you. And what I mean by that is I do all of them in Christ <laughs> because I do all of those things in Christ. And I've not been perfect. My obedience hasn't been entire. My law keeping hasn't been exact. And I need a Savior. If it's not faith alone in the Savior who saves sinners like me, I'm going to hell. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Thank you for being raised for me. I don't listen to much Christian music, but I listen to Fernando Ortega song, Ortega song. And he said, and when I am alone, give me what? Jesus, by myself, isolated, no family, no nothing. And then his last line is something else. And when I come to die, give me Jesus. And I said what Jesus said on the cross, not because I'm trying to copy the Savior, because he copied it from the psalmist. And Psalm 31, I believe, says, into, my, into thy hands I commit my what? Spirit. Because you're a saving God. That is literally the Christian life. Into thy hands, I commit my spirit. That's the Christian life. The Christian life is, I do this, I do this, I do this. No, the Christian life is into your hands, I commit my spirit. Here it is. Here it is. Here's everything I am. I'm a sinner. I'm a failure. I'm this, I'm that. I commit it to you. That's the Christian life. And because Christ takes it, saves me, makes me a child of God, I out of gratitude, then I seek to try to please him. But it's going to be imperfect. I don't look to anything I do. I look to what Christ has done for everything, for assurance, for hope, for peace, for comfort, for everything. It's not try harder. It's commit everything to Christ. It's to look to him. There's good news. I, the only way I can get in that I'm trusting, taking you at your word, God, that you're a saving God and that you send your son to die, not for his own sins, but for my sins. And he's my substitute. And I have all these words going through my mind. I was an enemy, but reconciled. I was a slave, but I'm redeemed. I was a sinner, but God's wrath has been assuaged. I used to be uh, having all my debts of my sin. They've been all forgiven. And God, I'm going to commit myself to you because if Jesus is a liar, I'm willing to go to hell. But since Jesus is alive, 
I'm going to make it to heaven. Right? That's good news when you go talk to people on their deathbed. And when the Lord Jesus looks at the thief on the cross, does he give him law or gospel? He could have done whatever he wanted. He could have tried to convince him he was a sinner, but he already knew that. And he said, into what? Today you will be with me. Good news or bad news? That's some good news. Can you imagine? Today you'll be with me in paradise. So while the law accuses, the gospel promises. And here you can read a little bit more. Number four, although the gospel will be the only outward means of revealing Christ and saving grace and is as such abundantly sufficient thereunto, yet that men who are dead in trespasses may be born again, quick and regenerated, there is moreover necessary and effectual and superable work of the Holy Spirit upon the whole soul. Anyway, it just says when God saves, He saves. While the law says you're a sinner and you're going to be damned, Romans 7, the gospel says Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am what? Foremost. Remember the Anglican Thomas Cranmer? Think Cranberry, because I always say in my Nebraska ease, Cramner. It's Cranmer. Thomas Cranmer. He knew people were coming to the Lord's Supper from Roman Catholicism. And how do you come to the Lord's Supper when you're in Rome or in a law church? It's, it's yikes. It's I'm not worthy to take it. Uh, I'm coming in an unworthy way. I'm going to be examining myself. And of course, there's, the text talks about that. But last time I looked, Jesus said, per Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, do this in remembrance of your sins. Did it say that? Do this in remembrance of me. I'm taking communion, I'm thinking, do this in remembrance of me. So Thomas Cranmer. This is very important. Now he's saying it just in a passing thing, but I will, I will just confess that I have handled the Lord's Supper as a pastor in a law-based way and not a gospel-based way. So soon we'll be doing the Lord's Supper at my church and I'm going to address my failure and approaching it in a more gospel. I still believe in closed communion, yes, because taking communion in an unworthy manner. Well, people at the Church of Corinth died, but I think the unworthy manner is taking it not, is, is, I think the idea is I, we're all unworthy. Our worthiness is that we are in Christ. We are in Christ. I come to the Lord's table, in a sense, committing myself fully to Christ. Here, take everything. Take my sin. It's not coming to the Lord's Supper all purified. It's coming to the the Lord's Supper trusting in Christ for the only righteousness that makes you worthy, which is an imputed righteousness. So um, I'm going to, we're definitely going to be doing some uh, changing that because I definitely have approached it way too much from a law perspective said, I'm going to give you four comfortable words, and they're all gospel words. How'd you like to have four comforting words? Here are the four comforting words in Thomas Cramner's Book of Common Prayer. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that those believing in him should have life eternal. Come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. It's a trustworthy saying deserving of all full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am foremost. If anyone sins, he has an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Gospel, 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 good news times four. You say those aren't just one, those aren't four words. I know, he said words in place of verses. You tell me if it is your gospel or laws. Jesus said, my father gives you the true bread from heaven. Go ahead, say it out loud. Gospel. When you say gospel, though, you have to smile. And if you can't smile, then what we tell our kids is you send a missionary to your face. So that's... (laughs) Christ was delivered for our trespasses and raised again for our justification, Romans 4. That's gospel. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. He was buried. He was raised in accordance with the scriptures gospel. This is good news. God doesn't demand. He doesn't ask for. He gives. He offers. 
The law says do this and live. The gospel says Jesus did it and lived so that you might live. The gospel gives grace. The gospel gives a blessing. The gospel says all your sins are washed away. All your sins are pardoned for the rest of your life. The gospel says when God saved you, your initial justification, we already know what's going to happen on judgment day because the initial justification is you're just, declared just, and therefore your final justification will be the exact same. Is this gospel or is this law? It is finished. Gospel. Good news. Heidelberg Disputation says the law says do this, it's never done. Grace says believe in this and everything is already done. All right, what time is it? It's 7.30, 7.25. So in summary for this first session, because we're going to take a little break, the gospel is good news. Oh, oh, you know what? Here, let's do this. I forgot I had this marker. Okay, I'm going to write in red because the gospel should be in red because Jesus has read letters. <laughs> this is the worst marker I've ever seen. I mean, an uh, um, eraser. Eraser. All right, now let's make it practical for tonight. Okay, law. Let's see, this is going to be evangelism. This is going to be holy living. If you're sitting in the back, it's on you. You should be sitting up closer. Okay, evangelism. Rome is all law. Do this. Roman Catholicism. Be better. Work harder. Seven sacraments. Protestant evangelicalism. Do this. Do this. Do this. Do this. It's basically all law. Whatever they say, it's it's law. When we preach, we're giving people the law to show them their sin, and then we offer them the good news. My Dublin story is I saw the man preaching on the soapbox. He was saying, repent, turn, or burn, and all that stuff. And I thought, you know what? With his courage and my theological acumen, not that's of myself, but I've been to quite a few seminaries in my life, graduated from none. (laughs) I'm going to help him. And by the way, I was in Dublin because I wanted to get some cool U2 glasses, Bono glasses, right? This was 25 years ago. Matter of fact, I met Bono and I shook his hand and he asked me to sing Neil Young's Southern Man on stage with him in 1982. (laughs) I said no, because I don't know the lyrics besides Southern Man. I said to the man preaching, don't forget to... I I just find it funny that in a law... Gospel distinct, uh, a church that makes proper distinction between law and gospel. I just find it funny. If you listen to a church that's law, 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 it's like secular music is bad. Secular music is bad. Secular music is bad. You listen to a church that's, that's trying to give a proper distinction between law and gospel. They've mentioned Tom Petty. They've mentioned uh, uh, Southern Man, uh, mentioned uh, Neil Young, and mentioned you 2 <laughs> It's all secular bands. So, what, so I guess the more, the better. I think that the better your theology, the better your music, okay? The better your theology, the better you will move towards, okay, all right, I know I'm going to tick off a lot of people there, but I just think it's interesting when you listen, when we listen to the sermons that are law-based, it's like, oh, music is satanic, and you listen to Law and Gospel, and they've mentioned Tom Petty, Neil Young, and you too, so yeah, that that's somewhat funny, all right. Tell them the good news, Jesus died for them, or Jesus died and was raised. And he knew it because, see, everything's built in law for us. That's our, and by the way, law is on the inside, and we need an external source to tell us, don't forget about the God. That's true. Someone just said, and he said he doesn't listen to Christian music. That's that's true. That is hilarious. There, there's got to be, okay, we've just discovered upon an ancient mystery, right? Proper distinction, law and gospel. You actually listen to good music. 
you blow up long gospel and you're like, you better listen to some Christian music. <laughs> okay. All right. That's usually horrible theology. And it all it does is copy the secular world and a subpar. World. Okay. I won't get into all of that, but it is funny. There, there, it is funny that because we've listened to a lot of sermons lately that clearly came from a more law perspective and it was condemn music, condemn music, condemn music. I mean, somehow J. Vernon McGee found a way to condemn music in the book of Amos. And you're like, what is, I mean, he found homosexual, homosexuality in a text that did not mention homosexuality. He found a way to condemn music that he found a way to condemn alcoholism when that wasn't even the point. He was finding sins when he was missing the point that, that that's because law looks for it to find a way to put in every sermon, do this, don't do this, 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 do this, don't do this. So it, it is, I mean, I know we're making, uh, having a little bit of fun, but it really is making a profound point. Gospel law is just built in everywhere we go, at home, school, everywhere else, our conscience. But the law has to, the gospel has to come from the outside. So I said, don't forget about the Lord Jesus. And as I told the men last year, as I did a preaching seminar even here at this church, I walked away and the guy turned immediately and he said, and Jesus Christ, the eternal son, came to earth to save sinners just like you. He died a death and lived a life for you and he has been raised and call upon the name of the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. Now, that's a great illustration, but I think it's true. I think a lot of people... They don't even realize in their Christian life, they're operating law. So that man was preaching, repent, turn or burn, repent, repent, and had not mentioned Christ. It was like, do this. You turn from your sin, turn from your sin, turn from your sin, because Christians are always worried. "Uh Uh-oh, someone's just going to believe in Jesus, and then they're going to continue to live in sin. Let me tell you, you can put all the law, all the restriction, you you can define repentance as a change of action. You can do all of that. But you're, it's not going to change anything because you guess what? People are still going to sin because they have a sinful nature. We're so worried that there's going to be people out there who believe in Jesus, but they're not going to live according to what you think they should be living according to. And, and that's easy believism. How about focus pointing them to Christ, tell them to, to, to trust in Christ for the imputed righteousness that they're saved. How about focus on the, the uh, gospel minded, but we're so law based. And then when someone points it out, then immediately we know the right words to say, believe in Jesus. He, he was crucified. He died for you. You, you, you know the words. The problem is we, we know the gospel, but we operate in the land of the, of the, of the law. It's just, it's because our, our, our nature just demands be law based law. That's how we live our life. Do this, don't do this, 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 do this. Dude, I mean, it's just, and then then we condemn everyone. Oh, they did this. Can you believe what they did? And I mean, we just live there. Gospel is like, so like, it's an alien language to us. He just went right into it. And I didn't do this with my body, but in my heart, I just went, yes. (laughs) So when we're preaching, don't forget, it's not just law. We tell them the good news too. The only thing I would say, if I'm preaching an evangelistic message, yeah, I better obviously have to have the gospel. But I, I, what I will say, and I stand by this, I know a lot people who hold to a long gospel distinction would strongly disagree with me here, but I will, this is one where, where I kind of depart with those who may have a proper distinction between long gospel. My, my focus is when I preach is what the text says. If the text is law, 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 I'm going to preach law. They say, but no, you got to give them gospel. No, I'm going to preach the text. They say, well, when are they going to get the gospel? They need to keep listening to the preaching. That's when, because I, I, I just think that my job is not like, well, this text is all law. So I better only preach about 15 minutes of it and then spend 15 minutes preaching gospel. So I get the proper balance. If the text doesn't provide the balance, then I mean, with Jesus with the rich young ruler, did he, did he ever offer him the gospel? Like, do this, do this, go sell everything, go sell everything, and you have eternal life. And he went away sad because he had many possessions. When did he preach the gospel to him? Jesus didn't make sure he balanced it out. He didn't make sure he had it 50-50. When the woman was caught in adultery, I mean, it was more gospel-based, right? Now, you could say he told her to go and sin no more. Oh, yeah, we, we, we could discuss that. But I, I, I just think sometimes, like, I, I, my job is not, here's the thing. I don't want to impose 
a long gospel distinction is a very important theological distinction and theological system that must be understood. But when I preach the text, I don't impose my theology upon the text. I preach the text as it is by the words that are used. So I, I'm very much in the like, and you say, well, someone could walk away confused. They could, but my job is to preach that text. That's the job of the preacher to me is to preach the text, not just to use the text as a pretext so that I can give her. So this is what it turns into. Every text is simply a pretext for me to preach long gospel. Or my, it's a pretext to give an evangelistic. No, the, the text is not a pretext for me to preach my theology. The text is there for me to teach the text. Wherever it leads us, it may lead us sometimes condemned and discouraged, and sometimes it may lead us to happy and peaceful and restful. I think we have to just go with what the text says. I, I, I stand by that. I know that I'm going to get emails disagreeing, but that, that's kind of my philosophy. All right, let's, continue. let's finish this up. He only has a couple of minutes. Okay. Now, but when it comes to holy living... Rome, again, just says law. You go to Roman Catholic Church, how many people are here ex-Catholics? Quite a few, but not as many as I think where I live. Oh, it drives me crazy. Everybody wants to pick on Catholics. Stop worrying about the Catholics messing up law and gospel. Worry about the evangelical Protestants. When, when it comes to Christians and holy living, it's law, 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 law. It, it, it is, and you know that live, 80% of the people are Roman Catholics, and so most of the people uh, at the church are ex-Roman Catholics. So when you hear preaching in Rome, it's pretty much law. By the way, when you hear preaching in most large megachurch evangelical churches, it's law. Okay, good, 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 good. All right, and fi finally, okay, finally, uh, I, I get so tired of everyone. To me, I, I guess what's ironic, it was Catholicism that taught me the lordship salvation was a complete obliteration of law and gospel. It was, it was Catholics who were like, that's basically Roman Catholicism, right? It's almost like an infused righteousness. You have to cooperate with the righteousness and a way to prove that you're saved. And I was like, wait a minute, wait. It was a Catholic university. It wasn't the Protestant seminaries that kind of said, wait, this lordship thing is more like Roman Catholicism. No, it was Catholics going, that's basically Roman Catholicism. And I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. So I just find it interesting that I was kind of pushed to a law and gospel distinction more by Catholics than I ever was from Protestants, which is kind of interesting. Ten steps, four ways, three tips, two methods. It's law upon law upon law upon law. There's nothing wrong with law unless it's only law. We'll talk about that tomorrow or maybe even tonight. Sanctification by law only isn't good. That's like, that's the good question. Your sanctification, do, does law lead to a greater motive? motive okay, let me read this to say that I'm not reading anything. Let me say it again. Does law lead to a greater motive, motivation for sanctification? I'm trying to put the two words together. Does law lead to a greater motivation for sanctification? What motivates someone to, to sanctification greater? Law or gospel? What should motivate you for sanctification? Because the whole concern with the lordship crowd is, whoa, whoa, you're saying people can live any way they want, live any way they want. But your, your motivation to sanctification is, if you don't do this, you're not saved. You, basically, your sanctification is simply there to prove that you're saved. And if you don't have enough sanctification, you're not saved. But of course, it's imperfect sanctification that somehow proves perfect salvation, which is a mess. But does it really motivate? Because now you have basically the external law trying to motivate you to sanctification. I don't think external law motivates, sanctification has to arise from within. Law only motivates ex external behavioral modification. Law leads to behavioral modification. Gospel leads to sanctification. That is at least my hypothesis. Law will get you to clean up the outside, right? Law will, law will clean it all up and look good. But I think it's, I think sanctification should be motivated by gospel. Um, well, 
someone said they both can motivate. Okay. Well, that's, I guess there's, there's motive. Okay. That's a good way of saying it. Um, law motive. I say, I will say this law motivates. And I, and if you think, who are you talking to? I'm talking to someone who's saying something in the chat. Sometimes I'll get an email like, who are you talking to? Sometimes it's people in the chat. Okay. Sometimes I forget to tell you, I just look over at my screen and see my screen and go like, Oh, I got to respond to that. So we're going to, we're going to take a few minutes. I know we're at an hour and 19 minutes. Just stay with me because this is important. I'm going to my iPad here and opening up the screen to make sure that I can make sure that the person listening uh, gets this. Okay, so someone just said they see what I'm saying, but I'm going to repeat it. Okay, so what what is the greater motive? For first of all, I'll say it this way: What is the great what what motivates sanctification the most, law or gospel? Yes, I agree. Both motivate, but I believe law motivates behavioral modification. It will have you go run around. You'll put on the robe of self righteousness. You'll grab your fig leaves. You'll clean up the outside of the tomb. You'll clean up the outside of the cup. I don't think I don't think law will do anything internally. I think gospel creates an internal motiva- motivation for sanctification. I think law has a limit, right? Law-based parenting. Do this, don't do this, you're going to be punished. Do this, don't do this, you're going to be punished. Stop this, you're going to be punished. Stop this, do this. Stop, stop, stop. Do, 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 do this. All this, right? Oh, you will get the behavioral modification until mom and dad's not around. Right? I think within Christianity, we have so much, we have a law-based sanctification, that creates a, a understanding that you better look the part, sound the part, talk the part. You can't, you can't be open and honest, right? So you better watch the right movies, listen to the right music. You got to play the part. But I don't think it really changes the inside of the cup. And I think gospel-based disturbs people because sometimes externally, a gospel-based sanctification it seems that it's too loose or they're, they're too open and, and they, they speak about their sin, but it's just more open. But I think gospel-based sanctification leads to an internal motivation because you're motivated by the promises and the grace of God. So, so where, is, where should motivation come from or the right kind of motiva- motivation? Does the law... Okay, um, it, someone says law, uh, I would say law can also motivate piety, or uh, which can feel very inside, but I totally see what you're saying now. Okay, I, I hope it makes sense. I, I just think law motivates behavioral modification, and that is considered sanctification. And I think gospel motivates an internal Ch- uh, desire and in- because you're motivated by gratitude and love and mercy and grace and you're operating from a position of eternal security but like the other kind well i've got to i got to prove i'm sanctified to prove that i'm saved so then you're motivated to pretend well, in gospel, I don't have to pretend anything because I know I'm saved because of an imputed righteousness. So I don't have to pretend anything. I can be more open and honest. So I don't know. You, you can tell me what you think. Going in and spanking your child and just saying you broke dad's law, you spank the child and say, get better. What does any father do that's any good after there's discipline, either verbal or other ways? You give them discipline and you then say what? I love you. Daddy, please forgive me. I forgive you. I love you. We're going to act like nothing ever happened. We're restored. But for Rome, for evangelicals, a lot of times it's that. More often, for evangelicals, they say, well, we had the law to tell us we were sinful, and we came to Christ, and now we have the gospel, and now what we get in church is pretty much just law again. Law after law after law. Statement of faith? Yeah, Jesus died and was raised. Jesus is coming back. Jesus weren't a virgin. Yeah, it's in my statement of faith, but it's not in the fabric of the church. That's what Graham Goldsworthy called. There's a functional gospel truth and an operational gospel. Operational is, it's in the London Baptist Confession, but, but, the, but, but functional, is it coming from the pulpit? Yeah, yeah, Jesus died for my sins, uh, but 
as an unbeliever, but I wonder if he died for my sins as a believer. Do you think Jesus died for believer sins too? Oh, Christians do not act like Christ died for believers. You, you come to church as a lost person. It doesn't matter what you've done. You're forgiven and everyone treats you brand new. You commit a sin as a believer, public humiliation, shame. You're disqualified. You're done. You're finished. We're going to gossip. We're going to slander. We're going to tear you apart. We're going to stone you at sunrise, right? Uh, it, it's, it's, there's not love, protect. Now, I'm not saying protect for illegal activity, but it's not protect, care, love, and restore. It's about, no, 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 no. There's got to be consequences. And now you can't do this, and you can't do this, and you can't do this, and you can't do this because you are a failure. Well, where's the gospel in the life of a believer? It's better to just say, you know what's best to do? Hey, hey, guys, guys, I'm sorry. I thought I was saved. I wasn't saved, but I'm saved today. Oh, okay, well, praise God you're saved. You're forgiven. You're restored. Now you're good to go. It's better just to, when if you get busted in sin as a Christian, just tell everyone you weren't saved, and now you just got saved, and then everything will be forgiven. But you don't get the same forgiveness as a believer. You just get marked and branded with the scarlet letter and then told that you should never speak or be seen again. So this is kind of a Wesleyan um, model where it's law gospel uh, to get saved and then it's law once you're in the church. And by the way, if you go to a church that's got one of those weird names, it's pretty much all law. I could, there are exceptions, I know, but if you go to Verve and Radical and Collide and Collision and Devastation and Enlightenment and Brilliance and Sunburn and Aftershave, whatever those weird ones are, it's just all law. They're just going to tell me what to do. But the way God does it, it's law, gospel when it comes to salvation. And then guess what? It's law, gospel when it comes to sanctification and holy living. The number one problem I see in all evangelicalism, sanctification should work this way. The law shows me how unsanctified I am, and I run to Christ, and Christ's love, grace, and mercy should be the thing that motivates true sanctification that starts from the inside and not simply behavioral modification. They've forgotten to talk about Jesus to their local church. Yes, give them the law, but afterwards, after you've laid the law on people, I think there's probably a few bruised reeds in the congregation that could use a little balm from the Lord Jesus. I think there's something about the Lord Jesus that we need to be reminded of after we feel convicted, but then we're reminded that he, he loves us. Jesus died for the sins of Christians too. And by the way... Wait, what? He died for the sins of Christians? No way. No way. That doesn't work. That, no, 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 no. You sinned. See, remember David's baby died, so you, someone's got to die. Someone's got to die. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it, it's always, there's always, why, what are the consequences? What are the consequences? What are the consequences? And we come up with what we supposedly are the cause. You can never do this again. You can never do this. You can never. And I'm like, where, where do you find the consequences? Well, in, in First Timothy, it gives some rules. And well, yeah, if I don't meet those requirements, but that doesn't mean there can't be a restoration back to a place of usefulness, right? Is that not possible? It's just weird how Christians just, it's, it's shame, humiliation, and it's basically be perfect or die. It's almost the way sometimes Christians act. I'm thankful to be here at this church because I know that happens. Do you ever think to yourself, we're coming to church today and we probably won't learn anything about Jesus? You probably never think that. If you're visiting tonight and you go to a church that way, that you never hear about Jesus, you better re-examine your church membership there. Paul said in no uncertain terms, Colossians 1.28, him... I would simply say, are you learning the text that is preached? That, I... Th I'm going to stand by that because I should not arbitrarily throw Jesus into a text. I preach what the text says. That's what I'm supposed to do. I, I'm dogmatic about that. We what? Proclaim. But here's what's going on behind the scenes that you don't know. Maybe behind the curtain, behind the pastoral curtain here. that the, congregate, the pastors don't want you to know. Here's what they don't want you to know if you're in one of those churches. 
If we offer the free grace to you found in Christ Jesus, even to Christians, you'll take advantage of it and go sin like crazy people. That's always the concern. If I offer the free grace of Christ, which it's free, oh, people are going to abuse it. So, so, so your solution is to keep people from abusing it. Let's destroy the gospel by bringing back the law. Or how about we trust the power of the gospel and its promises and its grace to do a work inside someone, right? Maybe, maybe that the gospel and love and, and grace and mercy can motivate, maybe. Or, I, yeah, I don't know. Let, let's continue. I'm telling you, that's why they don't do it. That and they're theologically not adept. We're going to talk next session about Christ for pardon. It's because of Jesus you stand before God, not guilty, righteous. And it's because of Jesus you can say no to sin and yes to righteousness. We don't leave Jesus at the door. Okay, <laughs> we're going to have to hear how I can supposedly say no to sin. See, this, now, this is where... This is where I'm going to have a problem because everyone can, I, Christians constantly say that we can say no to sin. Well, if we can say no to sin, we don't need a proper distinction between law and gospel because guess what? I can just now do it. Well, that doesn't work. So I got to know exactly what he means whenever, if we, if we, if we get to review that, we're not going to do it in this. He's only got like 50 seconds left. So we're about to finish this. But if we review the other parts of this conference, I'm definitely curious to see how now magically I can say no to sin. Once we're saved. Yeah, I got saved and I don't need Jesus anymore. No, you need him all the more. I'm thinking as I'm even driving here as a Christian man to do this conference. Jesus, help me teach. Jesus, in light of who you are, I, I want to, I, I need help. I need assistance. Jesus is for sanctification too. Christ for pardon and Christ for power. Christ for us, justification and Christ in us. I would say Christ is my salvation. He's my righteousness. And he's my, and he is my sanctification. Ultimately, I'm only sanctified in him. It's starting to get kind of hot in here. All right, let's take a 10 minute break. We'll see you here at 745. Snacks and drinks over here, right? And to give you all some law, don't spill. Don't, don't eat too much, kids. What are your names back there, you two boys? I'm kind of deaf. What? Skylar? Silas. What a great name. Silas. And what's your name? Oliver. If it's okay with your dad, why don't you two boys go first? Okay, go. All right. And there, that's how he ended. So we'll stop right there. You can email me, newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. That's newsif at yahoo.com. I would say more, but we're at one hour and 32 minutes. So the end. Thanks for listening. God bless.